Welcome to Cardboard Conjecture. We're a podcast about board games where we have opinions and conclusions formed on the basis of incomplete information. This episode of Cardboard Conjecture is brought to you by these great Saskatoon businesses. Amazing Stories Comics on 8th Street, Dragon's Den Games on 8th Street, and Breakout Escape Rooms on Faithful Avenue. Hey, how's it going, eh? This is What You've Been Playing Wednesday, and this is a special weekly episode where we get to share with you the games that we've been playing recently. And on this episode are... The Meeple Dungeon, Foster the Meeple, The Tabletop Bellhop, Dyson Dragons, Friday Night Games, Mr. Board Games, Definitely a board game podcast and cardboard conjecture. Always remember to check out the show notes to the links to the What You've Been Playing Wednesday cast. And as always, sit back, relax, and have a listen. Hello, everybody. It's Rob and Anna Marie from the Meeple Dungeon. Hello. And we are back again recording for the What's Been Playing Wednesday's podcast. And this week we've been playing one game. What have we been playing, Anna Marie? We have been playing Dice Miner. And I'm just going to apologize because I'll probably butcher <laughs> these names. Yep. So apologize in advance. Uh, designed by Joshua DeBonis and Nicola Risteski. Art by Lil Chan and Gregors Pedrich. And published by Atlas Games. Yeah, Dice Miner. Um, it's a cool dice drafting game. Um, thematically, you're uh, you're playing as a dwarf, and um, I believe you've been comfortable living above the surface since wiping out the dragons years earlier or centuries earlier. But now the dragons have returned and forcing the the dwarves back down into the mountains, and they're 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 excavating these mountains out and kind of getting back to their roots. And um, yeah, it's it's uh, it takes place over three rounds in which you're drafting in a two player game. 10 dice each right. off of this cool cardboard mountain structure thing. But ultimately, Dice Miner is a game about drafting the dice you covet, adding them to your hoard, and pushing your luck to build massive combos and score as many points as you can. So, Henry, do you want to tell them kind of what's going on here? Sure. Okay. So, um, basically, uh, you fill up your mountains. Cool little... Um cardboard standee yeah. that they've got there it works really well we have just the the retail version yep. um didn't need a big plastic yeah mountain. The, the kickstarter one is a gigantic gray mountain structure but this the retail the box is half the size comes with a nice cardboard one that's painted really nice i prefer it yeah no i really like yep. it um so there's basically little grooves for all the dice to fit in and you fill it up with uh with 20 dice and then one by one, you each take a die. So um, when you're starting, you can only take from the top. So you can't take any dice that is below another dice. Right. Another, yeah, and another die, I guess. And Yeah, um, like you couldn't pull one out and have one slide down. You have to take the one on top. That's right. Yeah. So no dice can move yeah. when you take it out. And then the next person goes and you just take one die, so on and so forth. Now, uh, one thing that dwarves are really good at is uh, sharing their beer. Mm-hmm. So, and they have each die, each colored, there are four different colored die, and each one will have, um, will have a beer symbol. Five. five colored? Yeah. Okay. White, yellow, blue, black, yeah, there's five. and green. Yes. So there's five. <clears throat> um, and uh, <laughs> each of those colors will have on one of their die faces a, a mug, a pint, a beer. So if you, uh, if you wanted to try and take two dice instead of one from the mountain, um, uh, you could take your beer die, roll it, say cheers, and pass it off to the other person. So yeah. then they get whatever face it ends up rolling yeah. to. So it yeah. could be something very useful for them. But then you get to take two die. You can choose it from a side or the top. So anything yeah. along the outer edge kind of. Um, so you could pull one out from the middle and have the others slide down We're using the yes, the, uh, the beer the beer die. Yeah. Sharing your beer. Um but there are the five different types of yeah. dyes. So you've so. got uh, you've got the 
white die, which are tunnel dice, and they're basically, um, you're trying to collect sets of, um, in order. So one, two, three, four, five. And yeah, just the pips. Yeah. Just yeah. the pips. Yeah. yeah. And you can, uh, you have to make sets, but it can only, they have to start at one. So you could have one, two, three, you could have one, two, you could have one, um, and you would add all those up together, yeah. but you couldn't have, like, if you had, uh, three, four, five, you yeah, wouldn't nothing. be able to, uh, to count those, they wouldn't add together. Uh, then you've got hazard dice, and those ones basically represent. You have a, a face cavens. that represents cavens, yeah, yeah. dragons, um, and That's beer. It. Different <laughs> numbers of cavens and dragons, yeah. and then a beer. Yeah. So when you get those, um, those are going to be negative points. Any type of cave-in or dragon you have is going to take away from what you have. So to mitigate that, they've got tool dice, and those ones have a, a pickaxe and a shield and treasure chests. So the pickaxe will negate any of the cavens you have, and a shield will negate any of the dragons you have. Mm -hmm. The neat thing with those ones is that if you get multiples of the pickaxe or multiples of the um, shield, you actually get to multiply uh, the number of either cavens or dragons you have and um, score them. And score them. So yeah. you get to multiply them and score them, which is cool. Then you've just got basic treasure dice, which are face value points. And then magic dice, and they basically let you re-roll at the end before you score your points. So you can re-roll some of your dice to try to gain uh, your points. Then once you've uh, all done that, yeah, you add up what you've got. Add up your and, points, and then, yeah, you do it two more times. Two and you do rounds. three rounds because there yeah. are three mountains. Yeah, and you're going to always, you're going to take the dice that you've acquired this round, and you're going to roll them again for next round, except for, there's actually the on, the, on the tool desk, yeah, dice, there's the treasure, treasure chest, and you can hold back two or three dice if you choose um, so you don't have to re-roll them. Yeah. But then, yeah, by the third round, you are uh, rolling 20 die that you've already collected and then selecting another 10 yeah. and using them as best you can. Because every round you're also gonna re going to replenish yeah, the, the mountain. Exactly. And then you start over again. And then, yeah, you, you add all your scores together, you use your magic dice to try and manipulate things <laughs> and you push your luck, which yeah. I've done many times. Uh, to great success and great failure. It's so, a fun game. It goes awesome. nice and quick. Yeah. And uh, just fun because um, there's not there's not really a bunch of dice chucking until you're trying to no. maybe use your magic dice and yeah. change die rolls. So it's nice because you have a chance to mitigate. But yeah. I really like it. Um, the one thing I wasn't too sure of, I wasn't sure what the purpose of winning was. You know, like yeah, the theme is loose here, real loose. Well, like um, even if it, well, even if they would have just said, and whoever wins the game, you've either um, <laughs> tunneled the best and you know settled again. I didn't know if I was looking to settle back in the mountain, yeah, or if I, I, I was trying to fight to the do. dragons again. I think it's no, tunneling, or, but yeah, hiding from the dragons. But yeah. yeah, the theme is yeah, you know. But it's a good game. It's I, really I enjoy fun. it. Totally fun. Um, yeah, no, really enjoy it. Be great to play with kids, adults, any setting pre-game night, post-game night type thing, because it only takes uh, 20 minutes or so. Yeah. It plays 1 to 4. I don't know if I mentioned that. But yeah, no, that's Dice Miner from yeah. Atlas Games. Really good. And it's uh, relatively well-priced and uh, nice components, great die, great everything. Really enjoyed it. Um, just a little plug here. Uh, today is Wednesday, if you're listening to this. Ryan and I from BC Board Gamers are going to be playing Ashes Reborn tonight, one-on-one. -on -one, uh, the first game of our best of seven series <laughs> and there's going to be a uh a gift certificate on the line for our local game stores so yeah if you're listening to this on wednesday it'll be tonight i think it's at seven or eight o'clock uh pacific and if you're listening to this after that it's already happened but we're doing this every wednesday uh until one of us has won four games <laughs> so uh yeah but no we gotta run uh, again this has been rob and Anna Marie from the meeple dungeon and we will see you next week cheers see ya Hello everyone, my name is Jamie. I'm Jeff. And we are from Foster the Meeple, a YouTube channel all about board games. And board gamey things. Exactly. We're here to do a, another edition of What You've Been Playing Wednesday. And we have been playing a lot of the initiative from Unexpected Games and Asmodee Canada. Haven't we? We have. It is quickly becoming one of my all-time favorite games. I don't know about you, Jeff. 
Yeah, I typically don't enjoy co-op games, but I've learned over this year that perhaps I do have a uh, affinity for co-op games, and this is one I've been loving. So let's talk a little bit first about what the initiative is actually about. The initiative is a unique cooperative board game of story, strategy, and code breaking. It lets players take on the role of teenagers in 1994 who have found a mysterious board game called The Key. Not only will they play the key, but players will help the teens through a pivotal chapter of their lives by following a series of missions linked together via interactive comic book. The game's campaign is broken into a number of chapters, each taking 30 to 60 minutes to complete, and each starting with you reading a page of the comic book. The story advances even if players fail a mission, but winning may provide a reward in the future. Each chapter builds on the knowledge and story from previous chapters, weaving narrative, code-breaking, and mystery into one thrilling game experience. Mm Mm-hmm. And how. This game is a cooperative code-breaking game. I can't remember if we already just read it or not, but I think there's like 15 or 16 missions, and we've probably, I think we've gone through the first seven. I think we're, yeah, well, we're about halfway through, I'd say. Yeah, and we've completed all of them successfully. No thanks to me, fully thanks to Jeff, because apparently he is a master code breaker. Who knew? Yeah, I have definitely developed a different way of thinking that my brain works. I yeah. never knew I was a code that breaker. good at ciphers and, and code breaking and stuff. Sign up for the FBI, would you? Yeah, Jeez. it's been super interesting to uncover that about myself. Yeah, so every mission, basically you're going through a room and you're picking up clues, trying to break a code or unscramble a word or Mm -hmm. do all of these different things. And after you do that, you get like a secret. And the secret is kind of this other code that you need to break that helps to unveil the story. And Mm -hmm. like we said, when we were talking about what the game is about, it's all about like this board game. You're breaking these codes and there's mysterious people that you don't know how they're involved and it's hard to talk about these games without spoiling anything yeah you know this game is definitely more i would lean on the experience side of the spectrum Mm -hmm. over the you know hard board game and but yeah it's just a really cool way to crack codes and you have these things that can happen that you might get a cipher that doesn't really necessarily have to do with the main storyline, but it could help uncover alternative options for your team to go down. And it's just, there's a lot going on. And yeah, we're trying to navigate this with spoilers because it is a bit legacy-esque. Campaign game. Yeah. So there are things that can happen that might be different from play to play, but it's been... It's been a slice. It's been a slice. A little slice of paradise. Yeah, I'm really into the story aspect of this game. Each player plays as a different kid. And when you get your player character, you each have an asymmetric ability. In the kid's mind, they are like this grown-up detective of some sort. So they it's Mm. almost like they have an alter ego. And it's set in the 90s, which is already cool. And it's also kind of going through these kids' lives and some things that they're struggling with, like bullying and self-image issues and popularity and school and all of these things. And I just think the comic book aspect of this is so interesting because it it just helps you to immerse in the game itself. You're telling a story to yourself as you play because the book is, uh, as Jamie mentioned, is a comic book and that is your guide through this world. Depending on how you achieve certain goals, you will flip through this comic book and read the story associated with the next chapter And depending on the way you do certain things, it might unlock a different kind of pathway for you to go through. So the comic book, yeah, it's super interesting. Mm -hmm. And to Jamie's point, like there are so many intertwining narratives between the personal stories of each character, you know, the overarching, as I mentioned, the overarching narrative of, you know, who you might be looking for, things you're looking to uncover. Like there's a ton of story dynamics involved with this game. Mm -hmm. It keeps you interested, that's for sure. Yeah, and you get to keep going through missions, win or lose. It just changes up how the game works as you go on. Not that we would know because we haven't lost yet. Yeah. Hopefully I I didn't just jinx us, but haven't lost yet. It's very fail forward. Yeah, it's it's been a really, really fun experience for us. Yeah, and we've played this now at two and at four, and Mm -hmm. the player count does not change the gameplay at all. Mm -hmm. It it really didn't impact our experience at all either. I think the more people you have, you're going to run into the same thing you run into with like an escape room where there may be too many voices. Cert- yeah, yeah too many cooks in the kitchen too many voices we didn't find that in our playthrough but it just it's going to depend yeah. on your play group but it's really helpful if you have one person who is really good at cracking
cracking codes <laughs> and another person who's really good at Googling stuff because that has been my specialty. Without, yeah. I had not, to Google the alphabet. Yeah, not not, That's go all I'm not say. Googling how things in the game work, but no, Googling like the alphabet. <laughs> you'll understand what that may mean in the future. But yeah, it's a lot of pen and paper like, oh, what, we just fig figured this out. What does this mean? And then you're writing it down and trying to find a code that might be within this text or this piece of paper that you've you've uncovered. Like it's just it's every time cool. there's something new kind of thrown in that you're like, wow, this is really neat. So that is the initiative. That has been our experience so far. We're really looking forward to finishing it. We're mm -hmm. actually going to go play it right now. Yeah, so that's our What You've Been Playing Wednesday. Once again, we are Jeff and Jamie from Foster the Meeple. You can find us on YouTube, on Twitter, on Instagram, all at Foster the Meeple. You will be hearing from us again in a future What You've Been Playing Wednesday. Later days. Later days. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop segment of What You've Been Playing Wednesday. I am Mo Tuzno, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. You can find me at TabletopBellhop.com and all over the internet as Tabletop Bellhop One Word. If you've got a gaming or game night question for me to answer, all you got to do is send that to questions at TabletopBellhop.com or visit our webpage and click on Ask the Bellhop. Now the question I'm answering today is, of course, what have I been playing this past week? So this week featured in-person gaming with another couple who aren't part of our immediate family. Now that everyone can be that can be is vaccinated in our family and Ontario is loosening gathering restrictions, we're actually able to get together with our friends, Kat and Tori, and play some games. Now, Tabletop Bellhop fans will recognize this couple as the people we used to live stream our Gloomhaven games with. Now, while we may eventually get back to that, right now we're trying to keep things casual and relaxed, and mostly I've been introducing them to the great games I've discovered in the last year and a half while locked down. Now, the first of those was Riff Raff. I just had to show this game to Tori, who takes great joy in all dexterity games, with one of his favorite games of all time being Rhino Hero. As expected, he loved it. Cat enjoyed it as well, and I am still really digging this game. What I'm finding interesting is the more I play this dexterity game from Zoc, is how it can actually be more about catching things that fall rather than actually making things balance. This is a rather unique twist for a dexterity game. Next up, I introduce the couple to Unfair. Now normally, for players who haven't experienced this game before, I would start off with the, end of the separately sold game Funfair, standalone game. The only reason I didn't do this is due to the fact that my copy of Unfair is a review copy that Good Games Publishing was awesome enough to send us, and I haven't been able to review the game for over a year due to not being able to play it at higher player counts, which is I think what the review really deserves. Plus, Tori and Kat play a lot of games with us and are experienced gamers, so I knew they wouldn't have a hard time grasping the concepts in Unfair. But for the average group, I do still recommend starting with Funfair before moving on to Unfair. Now, in this four-player game of Unfair, we tried out the Ninja, Vampire, Jungle, and Gangster themes. Uh, this was our first time with three of those, Vampire we had tried before. I was shocked by how much more cutthroat Ninja was to Vampire. That is a really nasty deck with a lot of take that elements. The jungle deck was just fun. Um, that just felt basic and easy with lots of uh, whimsical rides and stuff. I almost feel like you should use that in every game just as a balancing level deck. Now, Gangster was a lot of fun, some really neat stuff in it, but the fact it has some new attraction types that aren't in any other decks made that deck playability variable depending on how many people you were playing with, how many decks you were using. Because if you're playing with four or five players, the gangster cards aren't going to come up as often, whereas playing with two, they're going to come up more often. Now, as for Vampire, we played it in the past. I've always kind of enjoyed that. Lots of uh, take that elements in regards to people, not rides, which I thought was cool. Now, Unfair overall is an awesome game. Um, what we're really enjoying about it is the fact of the game changer cards that are included with the game that let you adjust play to fit your group. This is something I don't hear people talking about very often. Like, I've heard lots of people say that Unfair is too much take that to it. 
Well, there's a game changer card in there that removes all the take that elements. And there's also a version where you can play a shorter game where you only play six rounds. And then there's a version just for playing with kids that all you use is the ride cards. I love those game changer cards. I like any game that gives me dials I can adjust for my personal group. Now, next up, we played a couple versus couple game of trap words. Uh, this word game from CGE is really growing on us. Now, the last time we played this game, this was with uh, Holly and Brenda, we noticed partway through the last round of the game, we made a critical rule mistake. We missed something completely. And that's a very important fact. And that's the fact that the torchbearer, the clue giver, is the only one who can set off the traps. We were playing it so that the clue guessers could, which meant trap, 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 and almost no progression in the game, which was a little frustrating. Now, we did swap to the proper rules for the last couple of rounds of that game, and it didn't seem better. But this night, this game with Kat and Tori was our first time playing with the proper rules for the full game, and it made a world of difference. It's kind of shocking how playing the actual rules of a game can make it better, eh? With our original extreme plays, I thought the game was good. It was fun, and I could see playing it now and then. With the proper rules, though, the game went from meh to great. We ended up playing a second round this past week, in addition to our game with Cory and Kat, with our extended family, and this time we threw the kids in as well. Again, using the proper rules, of course, and that was a hoot. Now, Brenda and Holly, who had played the original version with us, realized, uh, agreed, the, the, the proper rules are better. Makes perfect sense, right? Now, the most shocking thing to me, though, was how much my kids loved this game. Like, not just liked it, loved it. One of my kids says, the best game we've ever played together. So now this is a game they want us to bring every time we visit Holly and Mim. Something I'll probably f give in to most of the time. Now, for more about Trap Words, I did get my review published this past week. That's live over at the blog. So if you want some more information, check out my detailed review of Trap Words. But I'll just say right here, if you're a word game fan, go pick that up. Now, the next game I chose to show off to Kat and Tori was Space Base. And that went pretty well, but not great. Now, I've mentioned this about Space Base before, but the whole charge cube system... It's just a bit obtuse. It's a bit, a bit opaque and hard to grasp for new players. And that again proved true during this game with our friends. And as I said, Cat and Tori are experienced game players. While this charged action system isn't complex or hard, just when you're learning the game, it's the hardest thing to grok during your initial plays. And I find most players in those first games actually avoid buying cards with cubes instead of taking the time to figure them out. Now by the second game or third game, everyone I've taught's fully got it and diving in and white cubes or clear cubes are being passed around all over the place. Now, I guess the lesson here is to make sure you give space base at least two tries. Or what I even recommend even more is your first game, make it a short game, play to 20 points at first or a 10 game points, 10 point game as a teaching game. Then restart once everyone's got all the game concepts down, like the charge cubes, and play a full 40 point game. Now, what I really need to do is get Space Base back to the table with Deanna and continue to try check out the Shy Pluto expansion. Because we only got about four stops in, if you know what I mean. Now, the final game we played with our friends was Codenames Duet. Again, we teamed up as couples. I thought Kat and Tori would love this game, and I was so right. This was meant to be our last game of the night. Like, all right, one more game, then we're going home. One round. That's all we were supposed to play. And it turned into, I think, four or six rounds of Codenames Duet in a row. I also know they left with plans to pick up this game for themselves to share it with their families. Now, the big thing I must point out every time I mention Codenames Duet is that despite what you see online and despite the listings on Amazon and despite the name of the game, this is not a two-player only game. This is a team-based cooperative version of Codenames that works great at multiple player counts. I personally think this is a stronger, more fun version of Codenames than the original. Now, my last game of the week is a five-player game of Tapestry with the Extended Family. Now, this was our first time playing with five, and I've got mixed thoughts. One, the game takes up a lot of room with five players. Now, Brenda's dining room table isn't small, and we honestly couldn't fit everything for this game on the table. We had to stack and overlap player boards. Civilization cards were stacked, and tech cards were kind of going into other players' play areas. We had to, we had to do some interesting things to make it fit. I will also say that five players makes for a very long and slow game. While the game worked, like it wasn't broken, mechanically everything worked great at five, the downtime was just more than I'd like in, most, in, in, a, in a board game night. Now what I did like was the competition on the main board for territory. That was better with five players. It was a lot more interaction and conquering going on. 
And I also really like the way the adjacency rules mattered more for who goes into the next era first and for the upgrade requirements for some of the technology. So that was a thumbs up. Now, this was also the first time playing for Holly and Mim and my daughter Gwendolyn. Now, both Holly and Brenda really want to try again. Having now seen the full game, it's one of those games you almost have to play twice, right, to, to fully understand. And they're looking forward to playing a second time. Sadly, though, my daughter did not enjoy the game much at all. Now, as for Deanna and I, we are enjoying it more every time we play, exploring the game further, checking out different ways, different strategies, and seeing the different civilizations. So overall for us, Tapestry, a big thumbs up. So that's it for this week. Those are the games that hit my table. Find lots more gaming content at tabletopbellhop.com. Be sure to tap out the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, which we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern on Twitch, twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Edited episodes of that podcast will show up on your podcatcher every Tuesday morning. Also, join us for Sunday Brunch with the Bellhop at 1 p.m. Eastern on Sundays. This is an unscripted show where Sean and I hang out and talk about whatever topic is of interest to us at the time. 99% gaming related. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I am Mo Tuzno, the Tabletop Bellhop. Good day and game on. What up, gamers? I'm Jason. I'm Julie, and together we're Dice and Dragons. You can find us on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook at Dice and Dragons, and on Twitter at Dice and Dragon. And what's this segment called, Jason? What you've been playing Wednesdays. And what have we been playing? Fast and Furious. I think it should be the Fast and the Furious, like the original movie, but in any case, it's now Fast and Furious, so we just have to live with it. Highway Heist, published by Funko Games, and designed by Prospero Hall. So, so, give the details about the game, Julie. <laughs> it is a cooperative strategy game uh, for ages 12 and above, two to four players, and it plays rather quickly in about 30 to 45 minutes. I would say that if you do play the max player count of four, you're probably going to get closer to that 60 minute uh, time frame that is suggested on the box. But at two players, once you figure this out, you're going to be hitting that 30 minute mark rather easily. And is it really a strategy game? No. I don't think so. That's just the way that Funko likes to classify the games. Well, it is a cooperative game, though. Yes, they definitely got that part right. And in this game, you'll be taking on the roles of your favorite members of the Fast family. Although I think it's pretty sad that they left Mia out. I mean, there's only Letty and for the female characters. So that's definitely a little bit of a ding on the overall production. You've got Roman, Tej, and Han. And I'm... Oh, he said Letty. That's why I was like, there's got to be someone else. And, and Brian and Dom. Of course, we saved the best for last. And what you're doing in the game is you're going through scenarios based on Fast 6 and Fast 7. You will be taking out enemy SUVs and trying to take out a tank, rob a semi, and also defeat Deckard Shaw as well as take out a chopper that's trying to shoot down Ramsey. So lots of stuff from the most recent films. So Julie, what did you think about this game? I think it's much more fun than it has a right to be. Yeah, I have to agree with you. I set this up, I read through the rules and I'm like, this game is going to be like kind of meh, but surprisingly enough, everything works. Now, I don't foresee us giving this necessarily like a glowing review or a high score because the game does have, I can't really say it as warts, but there's not a lot to it. But when it comes to delivering the ridiculous silliness of Fast and Furious and it just being fun, well, it, it has it in spades. It nails it surprisingly well. Yeah, we don't really have, we don't have anything like it in the collection. I think it definitely has its place in the collection. I think it's an easy, fun game, definitely on the light side. Uh, I, I, you know, it's funny that you said, is it a strategy game? It definitely doesn't really involve any strategy. Uh, I think any novice will be able to pick this up and play it. Uh, that being said, I think that people who, you know, gamers um, will enjoy it also when you take it for a light game that it is. Yeah, and I do think the game is deceptively simple, though. 
Uh, definitely pay attention to what's on the cards a couple of times in our most recent scenario. We walked some stuff back just because it was late and we were playing really quickly. And after we read the card, it's like, well, I would never have done what I did if I'd actually read the negative effects that could happen. Because in the game, you have these awesome stunts that you're trying to pull off that are either going to help you complete your scenario objective or gain some boost and do massive amount of damage to the SUVs. Then you have enemy cards, which will slowly move over to an activation space. And when they activate, bad things happen. So pay attention to those because they will help you decide on what actions you want to take. Because you may not want to be next to the semi-truck or next to the tank, depending on what that card says. You might be setting yourself up to get uh, run over by a tank. And while you can't die in the game, you just leap onto another vehicle and have to, <clears throat> excuse me, and hijack it, which is incredibly thematic. It, it can put you into some trouble, especially in that se semi-scenario where you absolutely need to have a player vehicle. Yeah. Anyways, I, I mean, I I enjoyed playing it. Um, I think it it has uh, you know it has it moves fast. There's a lot of stuff happening, uh, and I enjoyed that. I think it's it's definitely something, and I, I enjoy the fact that it's you know for two players, it's you know thirty minutes, thirty five minutes, uh, and that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that. Uh, now, like you said, there are some things that are you know not fabulous about it. Um, but uh, I, I enjoyed it. Like the components, the pegs, and the cars. Now, that being said, I don't think they're bad. They're just not fabulous. If this was a big Kickstarter game, they'd probably cost twice the price. You'd get a lot of really high detailed minis. So don't expect that. But I do think what you've got is cool and definitely feels like you're playing fast and furious. It definitely, it definitely does that. I mean, it, it plays its role very well. Yeah, they, they also don't have like any stills from the movie because they couldn't quite get the character likenesses. It's, well, if you tried to do this game years ago, probably could have done it now. Just a lot more expensive. But they've got the spirit of the films in this fun, quick game. And I really like it. I have to say, as you say, there's nothing like it on our collection. And this is great for even just starting out game night. Yeah, and I, I definitely think, you know, if somebody's looking for a game for, uh, you know, teens or uh, novice players, I definitely think this is one that you shouldn't worry. An introductory game, I would I would say. But also, I can see a lot of teen boys and teen girls who love the franchise really enjoying this game. Mia expansion, please. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's the one disadvantage that you did say. Uh, I think they could have definitely uh, brought a little bit more female representation. Well, there isn't that many female characters in the franchise, but I definitely think they all should have been present. So not having Mia is a pretty, pretty much a glaring issue. So I don't think we have anything else to say about it. Our video for this will be coming out in about a week or a little bit off of our uh, review schedule due to some minor changes we had to make last week. But uh, you'll hear our full thoughts in the near future. Again, thanks for having us on. And don't forget, keep playing, keep playing games. games. Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm John. And we're... People who like warm hugs. Friday Night Games. Oh, yeah. And Disney cartoons. You can find us on Instagram at Friday Night Games underscore official. Twitter at Friday Night GMS and on our website at Friday Night dot games. What are we talking about tonight, John? Oh uh, man, this is like game of the year 2019. Oh, am I gonna like it? Uh yeah, we are talking about trouble. Disney Frozen Olaf's Ice Ice Adventure game. Dope. Oh my, I am wow. You played this? Heck yeah, man. Without me? Without you. Why? I mean, you didn't want to invite me over to play this game? No, uh, it's two to it's two to four players and we've got a maxed out household at this place, so Dude, I love Olaf. He can <laughs> sit out around. I'll just I'll just like sit there and, and you know, dungeon master the game or something. Sounds good. So uh in uh, Olaf's Ice Adventure, uh, it's a two to four player skinned eye putting you know, I think it's a better version of the classic game Trouble, published by Hasbro. 
Uh, I didn't play it, but each player is playing as Olaf, trying to be the last uh, snowman standing, probably for warm hugs, I'm assuming. Yeah. Uh, so moving, ac- you move across the board based on your dice rolls. There's a second dice that has effects on it that help melt your opponent's snowman. Yeah, that's right. You're going to melt other people's snowman. So each uh, player has an Olaf that is shaped from an ice cube that you have to like pre-freeze in order to play the game. Stop it, really? Yeah, this game's amazing. This, this is dope. <laughs> so, and the effects include uh, you pour water on your players. Uh, <laughs> sorry, you pour water on your opponent's piece. You throw salt at your opponent's piece. Uh, you give the the opponent's piece a warm hug. So it, where you hold it, you hold it in your hand for as many seconds as on. you is, uh, rolled. Is this real? What like you pour real water on it? You throw real yep. salt at it. You get yeah. Wow, that's cool. That's actually super yeah. cool. Does it come with salt, or do you have to like get? Your uh, own no, salt? you you have to make your put your own salt in. Yeah. And wow, then, I'm uh, gonna make a game that tells people to go get components from the house too. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, you want to be the last snowman uh, standing, and basically you can do that. Um, there is a, an effect, one of the dice effects is you can put your uh, piece in an ice bath. So in the middle of the board, you have ice cubes, and you put your piece in there to help it keep it frozen. Wait, so. it, is the ice bath with water? Or is no, it no, it's ice? ice. It's ice cubes. Yeah. Okay, because I was gonna say if there's water in there, right, your, your, your Olaf's gonna melt. So I don't know if that's yeah. So great. Uh, we we were taking the water out with a with a uh, uh, a dropper, like okay. an eyedropper thing. Yeah. Okay. So. Cool. Well, uh, I mean, I would tell you what I like, but you know, I didn't play <laughs> it. I'm kind of jealous. That's fine. Uh, what did yeah. you like about it? Uh, honestly, like this game is genuinely fun. If you have small kids, like just playing with kids, seeing them smile, laugh and have a great time playing this game was obviously, honestly, the best feeling I've had. Um, my kids love it. Uh, they love trying to like pick on mom and dad. They're like, they didn't even like care about each other. They're like, no, we're going to melt you guys. Even though my kid promised they wouldn't do it. So, but, um, it's super messy. Um, so you need to have a clean space. Um, water plays great, especially with kids development helps with their social and emotional development. So that's always a bonus. Um, and it, uh, it makes family game days like so enjoyable. Um, and it's nice because it's easy enough that my youngest who's two, uh, can play along, but it also keeps my oldest, uh, engaged as well. I, so. I have a serious question though. How much fun would this be to play with like me, you and like Bill and Matt and Matt and, you know, no, what do, what do you, you know what uh i think we would enjoy playing it like i think it would be especially like bill and novi who uh are constantly trying to pick on each other type thing pick on each other like it would, it would be hilarious because they would just melt each other so quick i can see someone like so. launching the ice cube across the room too yeah yeah like the ice cubes aren't very big like i don't know the size of a marble maybe but it's uh you freeze it in like uh, a shaped ice cube with like Olaf's uh, feet mm-hmm. and it has like a peg that sticks out that you put his head on. So it's like his stomach you're, you're trying to melt. Wow. This game is actually like super creative. Hilarious. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I definitely, <laughs> I definitely would love to see someone playing it. That's for sure. Maybe I'll watch a nice. couple uh, kids videos. People playing them might be cool. Maybe I'll do Maybe I'll do a TikTok. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe. We'll see. Uh, what didn't you like about it? I mean, it doesn't sound like there's uh, much not to like. Am I kidding? Am I right? Yeah, there, yeah, there really isn't much to dislike about the game unless you don't like Frozen or having fun. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm. You're <laughs> Scrooge McDuck over here. Right. And honestly, like, Olaf's probably, like, one of the better parts of Frozen. So, like, you know, all that other, like, Olaf, or sorry, like, Elsa and Anna and stuff's not in it. It's just all about Olaf. Awesome. Um, the cleanup does suck. Um, you have to clean off like everything. Everything's wet after. Oh yeah, you're throwing salt uh, everywhere. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but you have to wait for, and you have to like wait for the thing to fully dry to put it back in the box, etc. Uh, and like obviously the big thing is you're using water and salt, which can be seen as you know wasteful. Um, yeah, I mean, although you are paying. For, well, I, okay, so like, yeah, you are using your own water and your own salt. And as I said earlier, and I'm gonna stand by it. We should make a game where we just tell you to get things in your house and, and play with it. And we charge you right? full price. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. That's trademark cry night games. Uh, yeah. If you're listening, July 12th, <laughs> 2021. Yeah. No one's taking that game. That's our game. 
We're making it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, honestly, like if you've got small kids and uh, you're looking for a fun game, Trouble Disney Frozen Olaf's Ice Adventure is so much hilarious fun. Uh, I, I recommend it. So Awesome. I will uh, hopefully play that with you sometime. Yeah. Yeah. All right, if you like what you hear, don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Friday Night Games underscore official, Twitter at Friday Night GMS, and always our website, Friday Night dot Games. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Boop. Hey, everybody, it's M. What's going on, folks? It's R. And together we're Mr. Board Games. And you can find us on Twitter and Instagram in case you haven't figured it out by now at Mr. Underscore Lonely Table. And on YouTube by following the link in our profile or by searching Mr. Board Games on YouTube. To make it simple. Mm-hmm. Today is... Tell me what it is today, Em. I think, I think, I think it's what you've been playing Wednesday. Oh, it definitely is what you've been playing Wednesday. And we would like to tell you about a wonderful game and a wonderful adventure called Seventh Continent. Yes, we'd like to take you to the Seventh Continent. We'll try to be as brief as we can because there's a lot to say about (laughs) Seventh Continent. Uh, Long story short, uh, Seventh Continent is a choose-your-own-adventure storybook where you legit have to explore. You have one single card out. And you've got four locations to go. You go to the next one. It's foggy. You flip over. You get an encounter. And then you get to see what it is. And as you progress through it, you literally, you draw a map. Mm -hmm. And it looks really cool. Because all the tiles, well, I guess the cards are all linked. They're all together. And eventually you get off your starting point and onto the, I would argue, quote unquote, mainland. Yeah, because I think you start on a little island for the most yeah, part. I think every time we play there. And then you get to the quote unquote mainland and you get lost. I think that's so lost. I think every single time we've played, we've gotten lost in finding our quest items. Like, I don't know if we've ever successfully completed a quest. Oh, no, we've died every single time. But that doesn't take away from the fun of it. And I know we, what, the, we got it on Kickstarter and it came with four quests i can't even remember i can't remember but i know it's at least four and we've played three of them i also got a bunch of the expansion packs we have ton of the ton of expansion packs for it we have the little miniatures we've played it with friends and i think it's so fun and it's sometimes painstakingly frustrating as you're moving around and you're like, oh, like I'm like, hey, I spend so many cards to move and we're wasting cards. And the mechanics are so simple. Uh, in order to do an action, you have to draw cards and your deck is the collective stamina pool. And if that runs out, um, you, if you draw a curse card, you're dead. Uh, you can get injured. You need to treat your injuries. Some of the cards have little hidden numbers on them or hidden resources on them. Mm. So you can build stuff. Um, it's got a nifty save feature. Yep. That's how big of a game it is. It's got a nifty save feature. And even when you save it, you will not be playing the second game. You won't be playing the same game because you shuffle the cards and things change. Things change. And when you save the game, you're you're back to only knowing kind of what you're standing on. A square. And you have to re-explore. So we haven't we've played with the save feature, I think, once. Um, and every other time we've ended it because we've ended in despair, but I enjoy the storytelling aspect of it. I mean, the HP Lovecraft inspired. I don't know if I could say it's HP Lovecraft inspired, but I do know there is a character called HP Lovecraft. But I feel like there's just of that kind of genre, like it's not Arkham, yeah. but it's, it's kind of that you know, mystical realm. And you never know why you're there. You can always forget, but it's always a certain curse which gives you a separate objective. Either find items, ring some bells. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a variety Yeah, of find things. some totems. It is a choose-your-own-adventure story. And I mean, I guess it's not as much of a choose-your-own-adventure. Like you draw a card and it says, do you hunt this? Do you do this action? I yes think or it's no? A, 
it's a directed choose your own yeah. adventure because either way it's fun. Yeah. You do get choices and you do get choices about which way you're going to explore. You know, are you going up through the jungle? Are you going down through the ravine? You know, your options are dictated by the objects you have. And the last point I want to make about it is that it is very much a nerve wracking experience because you watch that stamina pile shrink, 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 shrink. And you're like, uh, do I really need to, do that action. I think we're going to die if I don't do that action. It definitely makes you think and talk to each other. And yeah, you get that. the closer you get to running out of stamina, the more choosy you get about your experiences. I think right at the beginning, you, uh, you know, you're like, oh, let's explore everything. And then later on, you're like, uh, OK, we all collectively have to move this direction. And you, yeah, and you need food to live. And you need food to live. Medicine, etc. There's not a lot of fighting happening. It's like natural fighting. It's like I'm fighting a, a predator, like a bear or something. Yeah. So it's kind of fun in that regard. But we don't have enough time to talk about it at all. I um, know. And you need to take a look at it. And I think soon, I want to say soon, we will do a playthrough for our channel um, and show people what it's all about um, hashtag spoilers because you will lose some of the spontaneity of playing it. If you watch somebody else play it, you'll know what's coming in some cases. But, you know, if people are interested, you can always check it out. And that is what we've been playing. So until next week, you can check us out on YouTube or reach us on Twitter or Instagram at Mr. Underscore Lonely Table. And until then... Keep it on the rails. And the dice, if you're so fortunate to have them, on the table. And we will be talking to you all very soon. And we may not ever actually see you, but you can watch us play stuff. Because, hey, yeah. not. Um, take care of each other. Play games. and Make go, good choices. Make good choices and tell someone they're great today. And wash your hands. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I am A.A. Ron Millich. And I'm Royce Calverly. And we are definitely a board game podcast. The podcast definitely about board games, except when they're not. And we are here once again on What You've Been Playing Wednesday. Royce, what have you been playing on Wednesday? Nothing. Oh, well, that's the end of the show. Bye, everybody. But I've been playing games on other days that I can tell you about on oh, Wednesday. Oh, fine. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I played anything this Wednesday. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I've been playing a lot of BGA games due to COVID, blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Please in speak. fact, in our most recent episode, we are sort of talking about coming out of COVID and how looking back at online gaming a little bit. But one game that I really am seriously torn on whether to get it in a physical copy or not, even though I played it so many times online is welcome to right so welcome to is a roll and write game i've also played welcome to las vegas and welcome to with the expert variation which i highly recommend the expert variation i probably wouldn't play it without it the reason i'm a little hesitant to get it is with the expert variation especially there's three stacks of cards and drafting and all sorts of things and it just would be a lot of manipulation of cards between actions that's so fast on BGA. So if you haven't played Welcome To, Welcome To is a flip and write where you are setting up three pairs of cards effectively. You're picking one action and one number. You're putting the number onto your sheet. You're taking the action. You're building little suburbs. Uh, each street can only have each number once and so on. Really, really cool. Really neat game. Highly recommend it. I'm just curious, does anybody else feel that it is actually maybe better online? I don't know. Yeah, I guess. Well, we'll tell them our information at the end and they can let us know what they think. Absolutely. I've been playing a very frustrating game on BGA. Oh, good. I don't know why we keep playing this game because I never win at it. And it's, uh, yeah, it's highly frustrating. It's called Buttons. And this is a game I would love to get in a physical copy because I love the look of it, which is why I play it. Basically, you get a blackboard full of colored buttons and you're, in a, you're assigned a, a 
bonus color at the beginning, and you're trying to cover your buttons. Uh, and the more buttons you cover, the more stars you get. And then you try and line your stars up almost like bingo. You want either five across or five down. You can't go diagonally. And uh, the trick is, as the dice roll by each player, you can accept. So let's say you have a red button at four and three. You can accept, yes, I want to cover the red button at four and three. Or you can decline and turn it down. But as your board starts to fill up, if those rolls come up again, or if those rolls come up with one button around the button that you've covered, you go bust and you lose everything. Every button you've oh. covered, everything. So that turn, you're basically just a sit and duck while everyone else is collecting stars. And that's usually me. <laughs> <laughs> very, very, uh, you know, is a very... Um, stress inducing <laughs> anxiety you like to talk about these tension games where you're like oh come on give me the dice i need uh it feels like that uh and of course lots of cursing and swearing when you uh, bust out every time but once you get your five stars in a row uh you are the winner and it does feel like an achievement because it is so challenging and hard to do so i do recommend buttons if you like that kind of frustrating sort of uh tension building sort of game to give you guys an idea how frustrating this game is for aaron <laughs> We just dropped episode 35, so we've been going for like 70 weeks with our uh, podcast at that point. Buttons was a game that he talked about in our very first episode. Oh, really? And he has not won a game since then. <laughs> That's probably true, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. You're welcome. All right, what was that question you had about Welcome To again? I was just curious whether anyone else... Whether I should buy it or whether or not I should just continue to play it online. Is this a game that people would recommend that I pick up physical copies for? Because I'm really kind of torn on this one. So, so where can they tell me that? Yeah, so definitely board at gmail.com. Uh, they can also tweet, Twitter, twaddle, Twi I don't know. <laughs> at board definitely on Twitter. And then Facebook or at definitely board. They can find us there. We have a guild on we do. Board Game Geek, definitely Board Game Podcast. So any of those places, you can reach Royce and let him know whether he should buy a physical copy of Welcome To. And if you just want to listen to our episodes, which I highly recommend, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all the places podcasts live. You can find us there every other Tuesday. And despite his complete inability to win at buttons, he's right about listening to the episode. <laughs> Thank you, Royce. Anything else? Not a thing. Say goodbye, Royce. Goodbye, Royce. Bye, everybody. Hey everybody, this is Norm from the Cardboard Conjecture Podcast and Bridge City Board Gamers here in Saskatoon. And you know what? It's been a while since we've gone to the Facebook page and uh, had a look to see what the community's been playing. So this is always exciting. All right, so let's get to it. Lane! Uh, we always can, can guarantee that Lane has got a list of stuff. Here we go. Uh, Monopoly the Card Game. Scrabble, Zombie Kids, Sagrada, and Parks. Awesome. You know, Zombie Kids, I have to finish that one with Daniel. That's so, that, you know, that's such a fantastic game. And uh, Sagrada, Parks, I played Parks just recently. I think we did a, did a little blurb on the, on, uh, the podcast. And uh, what a fantastic game. The art is gorgeous. So let's carry on. Hands. Ooh, okay, have a sip. Hands got a list here. So everybody have a sip, have a stretch. Here we go. Uh, the Crew, Merchant's Cove, Rajas of the Ganges, Architects of the West Kingdom, Mountain Goats, Reef, Trails of Tacana, Miyabi, uh, Tr Trismegistus. I think I did that. <laughs> Raiders of the North Sea and Tekenu. Oh, did you sleep at all last week? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I've played a few of those, and, and a couple of those I've not, I've not even heard of. And, and I'm surprised I pronounced one of them correctly. Yay! Cold Reed, yay! Um, the Crew. Ah, I want to play that one. I have that one, and it's the, uh, it's the cooperative trick-taking game where you're going through missions. And uh, I've heard 
excellent things about that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, would, I could analyze your your list, but uh, you know, we got some other stuff to talk about. So Ryan, Ryan uh, did not uh, uh, put up a, a segment today, but I'm going to tell you what he played. Got to play four games of Great Western Trail this week. Bunch of camel up and point salad. My son's latest obsession. And as well as Clash of Rage and Marvel United. Um, uh, also, so, oh, oh yes. Also some games of Ashes Reborn, Rise of the Phoenix via Zoom with Rob from the Meeple Dungeon. So we're going to be, uh, yeah, have a look at our, we have a Twitch channel now. Woo! Look at us, fancy people. Um, uh, yeah, so have a look at that, and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna see if I can get in on the chat and and uh, cause discord. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Elena or Elena? I'm sorry. Please, please let me, please please forgive me. Um, finished Pandemic Legacy Season Zero. It was a ride for sure. Um, we did a pandemic legacy episode and we talked about season zero and we also had the opportunity to interview Rob Davio, um, in that whole kind of month of legacy and wow, that was such a, such an excellent talk. So yay, that was awesome. Season zero. I don't want to spoil anything from all the knowledge I have and I've not played any of those. So I'm not the guy to talk about that. Jason. We only played New York Zoo this week. It's the slow time of the year for getting games in. Well, I have New York Zoo, and it is, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a fun game. I like it. I'm not going to say that it is going to replace Patchwork, but it's, um, it's basically Patchwork with more and a different theme. So if you like Patchwork, I would give that one a try. It's, very, it's, it's a lot of fun. And there's a really good solo mode in it, too. Cool. Tim, Age of Sigmar, um, starting a path to glory campaign. Right on. And he's showing, he's, uh, I think he uploaded some uh, painted minis. Yay. Uh, that's my Zen time, painting minis. Yeah, yeah, the brain just turns off and it, it just, <laughs> I go kind of zombie. Or, or, no, is the word catatonic? All right. Uh, let's see, carrying on, John. Played Sentinels and Seven Wonders. Nice. Good, solid. Good, solid games. Um, Sentinels, I don't think... I'm, I'm, I don't want to say Sentinels of the Multiverse because you would have wrote that. But uh, Sentinels, I don't think I've played that one. Uh, Eli finished uh, Innsmouth Conspiracy for Arkham LCG and uh, started Galaxy's Most Wanted in Marvel Champions and Drax and Gamora. Sorry, with Drax and Gamora. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Marvel Champions. That's, that's Ryan's gig. But uh, yeah, I have, <laughs> I'm not as, as in depth as of a collection as Ryan, but I like it. I've got, I've got my stuff. I've got my Marvel stuff. I dig it. I, I got the uh, Red Skull. I have to find some time to get through that one. Uh, and the Arkham LCG. I'm so, I'm so embarrassed to say that I have the base game and I haven't even played it yet. So shame. I'm going to go sit in the box of shame for a while. Uh, Jeff. Jeff has a full week of games and he's got a list. So I'm going to going to burn through it. So Architects of the West Kingdom, Merchants, I think, uh, Merchants Cove, uh, Miyabi, Mountain Kings, Raiders of the North Sea, Rajas Reef, Spirit Island, Takenu the Crew. It's very similar to another list. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, on that list, the one that popped out to me that I have to play some more is Spirit Island. That is, that is a fantastic game. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm not going to go too much into it. <laughs> but uh, it's basically, um, I, as everybody says, it's basically when Catan fights back, right? <laughs> so uh, that being said, I'll let you look into a little bit more. But yeah, it is a good uh, puzzle brain burner of a game. Tony played code names, Quiddler, King Domino, and Anomia. Anomia, that oh man, talk about giving your frontal lobe 
and working memory, the emergency brake four wheel skid into a brick wall when you're trying to think of a word. Um, that is, you know, that game and cockroach poker are probably one of my two favorite kind of warm up games to uh, introduce to people who are, aren't as in deep into the hobby as most of us are. So, and uh, <laughs> if you're if you're not giggling in the first five minutes of Anomia or even cockroach poker then uh then you're asleep <laughs> so okay let's move on matthew the last one of the list matthew has played among the stars terraforming mars and dwarves so or is it dwarf seven I, i'm not i you know i can't figure that one out okay but you know what uh terraforming mars excellent engine builder um uh, a lot of a lot of people are fans of that game in this community and uh, among the stars uh, I haven't played that one. I've heard a few cool, you know, I've heard a lot of things about it. Um, probably haven't played it because I just got a lot of games. Um, and uh, that being said, uh, thank you so much for making it to the end of the episode. Yay! Uh, you're awesome, eh? And uh, thank you so much for the contributors of this episode. Fantastic content. I can't wait to... Uh, have a deep dive listening to all of this. And, uh, you, you know, if you if you can, can take the time, uh, click on some links and go check out their uh, their own brand content. And, uh, yeah, do some exploring. And that being said, keep your stick on the ice and take care out there, eh? If you like the content that we produce and the type of show we're creating, Please leave a happy rating on iTunes or the podcast platform that you use. This would be such a great gift, and it would help make it easier for others to find us when they search for Board Game Podcast. This episode of What You've Been Playing Wednesday has been brought to you by Cardboard Conjecture, who recommends to you that the first time you get a chance to play with people, don't play your whole collection in one night.